The journey to the draft is driven by AAA. AAA, roadside is their strong side. Make AAA a part of your game day today. AAA, go ahead. With the 25th pick in the NFL draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select. You're listening to the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Journey to the Draft podcast driven by AAA. I'm Fran Duffy. We had an awesome weekend of college football, and we're going to break some of that down here today on the Journey to the Draft podcast driven by AAA. I'll be joined by Ben Fennell at the top of the show for Saturday scouting. We're going to break down what we saw this weekend on college football, look ahead to some of the announcements we've got for the Senior Bowl. We'll continue to do that week in and week out as we get closer and closer to the number one all-star game in the pre-draft circuit. Then we will talk with an awesome guest. We're really, really happy to welcome in Vice President of Player Personnel Andy Weidel to the show. We're going to go under the hood of the personnel department, get an idea of what all 32 teams are doing this time of year as the college football season comes closer and closer to an end. So what are teams doing to prepare for the postseason and get ready for the NFL draft? We'll talk all about that with Andy Weidel in that segment of the show and Mr. Relevant. Next up, I will catch up with Tony Pauline, get a little bit of word on the street in draft buzz about what's going on around the country. We've got a scouting report on a senior Bowl acceptance. We've got a great question for you in draft mailbag. Ton to get to in the show. Let's go. Let's start things off now in Saturday Scouting. It's time for Saturday Scouting. Well, joining us once again here on the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA, our friend Ben Fennel. Ben, uh, welcome back. We got look. We got, we've. I don't even want to get into any of the pleasantries. We've got like so much. Yeah, just to cut cover. out all the fluff. Yeah, we got to get right to we it. Got, we We're in the much. meat of the college football season. We got Senior Bowl invites, Shrine Game invites on the heels of the Alabama LSU game. Dude, Saturday was awesome. College football, fantastic like, weekend. Yeah, we, fantastic weekend of football. No, pretty question. much from Friday to Monday yes. night. You know, college, NFL, the whole deal. We we've talked about how some of these games, the big time matchups this year haven't quite lived up to the hype that went out the window this week this this was an awesome matchup or an awesome weekend of matchups all right well let's get into your game you know texas kansas state that uh, went down to the wire as well yeah field goal as time expired this game not really uh in contention for the national title picture here but fun game a good matchup there tom herman getting the win actually the first texas team to beat kansas state three straight times oh that's uh, which is kind of interesting interesting kansas state also one of two big 12 teams okay with a winning record all time against Texas. Who's the other? Oklahoma. I don't know. Probably Oklahoma. Right. Probably Oklahoma. But, yeah. All right. Well, let's get into uh, the, the your superlatives from this game. Yeah. Uh, let's start off with our game ball. Who gets the game ball? Texas first. Kansas State. Game ball. Let's go. Brandon Jones. Uh, okay. Senior bowl safety. Uh, Great. Be heading down to their mobile in a couple weeks. Um, had a punt return that set up a touchdown in the second half. Also forced a fumble. Okay. Uh, a couple big plays. Also gave up a couple big plays on the opening right. drive. Missed a tackle in space that allowed for a big touchdown. Mm. Also couldn't really get width on a corner out against a slot receiver, uh, but made enough plays in the second half to kind of give Texas the advantage. So we've got like. 40, 50 names. It's not yeah. that many. It's, it's like 30 plus uh, for the Senior Bowl that we're going to cover in this in this week's show. And as we go, if we talk about any of these guys, I'm just going to kind of but we'll go off script a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. Brandon Jones is one of those guys. Yep. I had a chance to study him last week uh, before your game, after we recorded last week's show. 5'11", 202, you mentioned some of that stuff. I mean, special teams impact for sure. Yep. Explosive athlete. I love his range. He was used in a lot of different ways in the games that I watched. I watched three games. He played different roles in all three he'll games. He'll be on the slot. He'll be a back-end player. He'll be a box player. He'll yep. you know, contribute and run support. He's explosive athlete. No question. I'm playing the slot. High school track guy, and that shows up uh, on the football field. My question was tackling, and you yeah. mentioned that was that, that was something that showed up in this game. I think he's a little bit better of a football player than Gary Johnson was last year. Okay. I think Johnson was just pure speed. I think he has a little bit more nuance in his game for yep. the next level. Um, but an interesting player with a really diverse skill set. Yeah, I think he could be a, a post player slash you know big nickel safety as well. Yeah. Uh, a guy that can come in and, and play a different a number of different roles for an NFL defense. All right, let's get to your one play takeaway. What one play stands out from this game? Well, we're just going to ruffle right through him. Another senior bowl player, Devin DuVarnay, yep. slot receiver, 5'10", 205, 210, kind of a rocked up running back looking receiver mm. playing in the slot. But this is what he does. He's third and 14 with three minutes left. Tough catch, underthrown, down by the sideline, went down and got it, slid, stayed in bounds, kept the chains moving, which set up the eventual uh, game-winning touchdown at the end there. But that's what DuVernay does. Yep. Tough catches, third down, move the sticks. He's not an over-the-top guy. He doesn't have elite speed. He's not a vertical threat. Mm. He's that quarterback's best friend. And that's why my comparison, Heinz Ward, 
Devon Best, if you remember mm, him, yep. early in his career with the Miami Dolphins, really good receiver on third down that just knew how to get open and made the tough, dirty catches in the slot. That's Duvernay. See, I I disagree a little bit in terms of the vertical ability. I do think he's got some ability to go deep. He hasn't been used as much in that role this year, and I actually went back and watched some of his bigger targets from a year ago just because he was used more on the outside. I wanted to get a better sense because one of my questions watching this year's film is, all right, you know, what is his ball tracking like? His ability to track the deep ball? Can he look it in over his shoulder? Can he you know flash late hands and be able to track it over his shoulder? I'll tell you what, he did that a good amount last year. And I agree with you that he's not explosive in the first, you know, five, eight, ten yards, mm-hmm. but it's like 10, 15, 20 yards where he turns on that extra gear and he's got the ability to run by people. He just doesn't look like a typical receiver. He is he has that James Washington type of body. Yeah, he does. Where he's a little bit wider, a little bit hippier, he's got a big butt. He looks like Debo Samuel. I yep. remember looking at Debo in a pregame, and he looks like a running back. Mm. Uh, but he's out there in the slot, and we've seen, you know, how successful Debo's been. And uh, I think there's a place for Duvernay at the next level. Yeah. I don't think he's going to test particularly well. I think he'll test okay. But I think he's the guy that's going to run that gauntlet at the combine right. and just go pluck, 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 pluck so naturally. And this mm. is the guy that's going to move the chains on third downs. Well, that's I think you could say something similar. We'll talk about the other senior ball wide receiver from this Texas squad. Yep. Uh, Colin Johnson, another senior. Big name coming into the year. A lot mm-hmm. of people had him in mock drafts. You're not seeing that as much now. He's been battling through some injuries. Uh, 6'5", over 220 pounds. Big, strong kid. Great blocker. Does catch the ball pretty softly uh, at the catch point. Um, the question you have, speed, athleticism, ability to create his own separation. Yeah, and that Texas group of receivers, they have a bunch of kids that are 6'4". Mm-hmm. I know DuVernay is like 5'10", but yep. most of them are 6'3", 6'4". Colin Johnson like towers over the entire group. This guy is so tall, so long. I initially was going to have him be my off the bus guy, just considering how tall and long and freakish he was. You really have to see him up close just to appreciate the basketball player body that he is. Uh, But they also have a true freshman nose tackle that started every game this year, 6'2", 340. And that's uh, Keandre Coburn. So, uh, really good int- interior trench player and for Texas. That kid so. looks the part. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. So, both of these guys, uh, the two seniors, Duvernay and Colin Johnson, will be down in Mobile. We'll get eyes on them as well as the safety, Brandon Jones. All right. Uh, let's now go to the down the road freak show. You mentioned Keandre Coburn, a, a true freshman defensive tackle yep. who started every game. But, uh, you know, I know you've got some other guys, some skilled guys on offense. Yeah, a couple guys on offense. And I thought their best player on offense in the game was Keontae Ingram, who's a uh, sophomore running back, six foot. 220, really good contact balance, had two touchdowns in the game, 16 rushes, 139 yards. Seems like any time Texas committed to the run game, mm. they were getting production and getting big runs. And then suddenly they'd go the next drive and let Ellinger you know, throw it, and they'd go three and out. And yep. I just felt like they wanted them to commit to the run game. Another guy that's been on our radar, didn't really do anything in the game, freshman receiver Jake Smith okay. was the National Gatorade Player of the Year, Arizona State Gatorade Player of the Year uh, in 2018, absolute speed demon, mm. Andy Isabella-type track speed on the football field. Okay. Doesn't play a lot right now, but when he's on the field, it's going to him, and it's going downtown. Interesting. Um, we didn't see it in the game, but he's a guy on everybody's radar, and everybody knows about him in the uh, recruiting circles. They got another receiver, uh, Eagles, right? Who's made yeah, some big Brent, plays? Brent for them. Eagles. Yeah. yeah, there's a couple interesting guys out yeah. there. All right, well, let's uh, let's now move on to some other games. And um, look, the two big ones I think coming into the week, uh, certainly LSU Alabama. That yep. was the game of the season, uh, and then Penn State Minnesota. I'll tell you what, I sat on my couch at 12 o'clock, I had my son on my lap, we watched both games straight through, he was a champ uh, for the most part, and uh, we watched both games, but I got to look, I want to give the, the, the game out of the quarterback from Minnesota, he was 18 for 20, you know, threw for a bunch mm-hmm. of touchdowns, he, he was flaw, near flawless. Can't not give it to Joe Burrow, though, for right. what he did against that Alabama defense. Uh, I know that defense isn't quite what we've seen from them in the past, but uh, to come out under the lights with so much hype, so much expectation, go into Bryant-Denny and beat the Tide, look as dominant as he did, I mean, the guy was – he didn't buckle at all. I mean, he was under pressure. They they did get to him a few times. I think they sacked him four or five times, yep. um, but never wavered. Ended up I – mean, every time it seemed like, oh, Alabama, they're within a score – Joe Burrow and LSU answered. I mean, it was yeah. uh, he was really impressive. I think his poise kind of just stood no out question. first and foremost. Just being on the road, never frazzled, and just never had that kind of wide-eyed moment, even in the pocket or in a down or panicky. You know, just I just think the way he held that moment and held himself there, I think, gives that offense calm and lets everybody know we're okay, even though that drive didn't go well or I got sacked or yep. we blew a protection. 
his calmness, his poise, really good leader. He had a, a completion. It was the fourth quarter, third and long, where he dumped it off to the back. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alaire, uh, Clyde Simmons, Alaire, or yeah. Clyde, whatever the kid's name is, who was awesome in the game, yep. dumped it off to him. But just did a great job of just understanding, you know what? I know it's third and long. I'm getting ready to get blitzed. I need to get this ball out. And he got it out so fast that Alaire was able you to make me, a play. You know me, well-timed checkdowns yes. and going through your progressions quickly and giving that underneath route an opportunity to get yards and get up the field and yep. maybe move the sticks. I love that stuff from quarterbacks. Uh, some missed tackles from the LSU secondary we yep. saw in this game. Uh, Trayvon Diggs did, did, did give up some big plays down the field for Alabama. Yep. But I'll tell you what, some of those catches were just ridiculous catches also by the LSU receivers. You know, in the last 10 years, we've seen a 10 nothing game. We've yeah. seen a 9-6, 9-6 double yep. overtime game, I'm pretty sure it was, a couple years ago. I was okay with the offensive kind of this was onslaught. Awesome. It was fun to watch. It I can so appreciate a good defensive game. Yep. But there's so much speed and athleticism and explosiveness on the field mm-hmm. for both those teams, LSU and Alabama. I just want to see it go to work. Yeah, it and, was, and, it, and it did. I, it did not disappoint. It was a lot of fun yeah. watching this game. But uh, the 12 o'clock game did not disappoint either. And I, that's where, you know, I, I had a lot of different options there for what I was going to do with the one play takeaway, you know, with the minutes with the uh, LSU Alabama game. But so, you know what? Let's talk about this Minnesota Penn State game with Antoine Winfield. The I think he's a a fourth year sophomore because he was given an extra a, a medical hardship as a redshirt sophomore. Oh, interesting. So okay. technically, he still has I think three more or two more years of eligibility, um, but certainly could come out yeah, as well. There's a couple guys on that team with a couple well, yeah, eligibilities. Smith yeah, I know he's been around for six years or so. Well, the compliance guy there, he does a good doing job. Something right, he's yeah. doing something right. Uh, I'll tell you what, Antoine Winfield, when I studied the two Minnesota kids that are going to the Senior Bowl, we'll talk about them later, with Tony, Carter Coughlin, and Kamal Martin. Mm-hmm. Nice players. Dude, Antoine Winfield flashed every single time. Uh, a little bit undersized as a post, post safety, but like his dad, good tackler, competitive, yep. rangy, and that range showed up. He made a really good interception uh, late in the first half where he came off the post uh, and made a play outside by the numbers. Um, could have been, It was two interceptions early in the game. Could have been a third, mm. jumped another throw. Uh, he was all over the place. And that, 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 that second interception, to me, really stands out as something I'll remember. And when it's all said and done, I wouldn't be surprised to see the other senior linebacker maybe get an invite to one of these All-Star mm. games, Thomas Barber. A little bit of a different package, big, heavy linebacker uh, related to Marion Barber, Peyton yep. Barber, or the you know, football Barber family. But uh, another senior linebacker, and that team's got some veterans on them. Yeah, the, I'll tell you what. They've got a million captains. Yep. Uh, there's something yeah. I tweeted out that I think they've got like 40 guys with a C on their jersey. Uh, and I was making fun about it early in the game. But, look, they, they did everything they needed to win that game. It was, a, it was a really fun contest. A lot of credit to P.J. Fleck and that whole team. Tyler Johnson and yep. both receivers really made some great plays. What's the other receiver's name? He's um, really interesting, uh, Yeah, tra- I think he's a sophomore. He's he, not eligible. No, he's not eligible for this year, right. I don't believe. But, uh, actually, he might, I, he might even be a redshirt sophomore. So he yeah. might be eligible. Gotcha. But either way. P.J. Fleck does a great job of uh, developing receivers. We saw that at Western Michigan. You know, right. Corey Davis, they had the slot guy that I really liked uh, the year afterwards that came out that was drafted by the Bears. I can't remember who put round. it out over the weekend. It might have been Dane or Solak or somebody was saying, I think the three best receivers in the Big Ten, none of them are eligible. It was right. Rondell Moore, the kid from Minnesota. Sure. And uh, I think one of the Pens. Oh, no. Uh, the uh, Olave kid from Olave, yeah, Olave from, from, from Ohio State. State. Yeah. Sure, that makes sense. No, it's uh, those Minnesota kids. They made a lot of plays. It mm-hmm. was it was a fun game, yeah. really fun game to watch. Um, Penn State, uh, you know, I think that you know Sean Clifford it was maybe a little bit too big for him at times. Um, you know, he was he was off. They had a lot of drops offensively, uh, but Minnesota they made every play they needed to make. To I win love that just game. hearing that the best receivers in the Big Ten, ones at Minnesota, ones at Purdue. Yeah, that's, like, that's pretty just cool. great to hear. No like, I just love kind of hearing the competitive balance in that conference and and teams that you. You know, have kind of been bottom dwellers in the conference, suddenly rise to the top and ruffle up some teams. No question. Yeah, so, it's fun to watch. So uh, we got your thoughts on where you were this weekend. Yep. I, got, I got some thoughts on where I was this weekend. How about our producer, Peter Kelly? Yeah, out in, on the road as well. In, yeah. On the road, in attendance for Wake Forest going on the road to Virginia Tech. They lose, and they lose uh, Sage Surratt. He's out for the year. Right. Uh, we got that news. We'll talk about it a little bit here with Tony. But um, – Virginia Tech coming away with a big win. The player that Peter said was the guy, the guy 
100 percent stood out, and you heard him his name constantly. The safety, Divine Diablo, 6'3", 225, was all over too. the field. Yeah. What are the best names in college no football this year? So keep an eye on Divi- Virginia Div- Tech safety. Virginia Tech safety. I feel like they always have great names back there. Remember Macho Harris a couple years Macho, ago? Yeah, we remember Macho Harris. Yeah, that sounds a great name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, all right, well, let's get into where you're heading this week. Let's talk uh, Oregon versus Arizona. So we, I've, I've watched Oregon like seven times this year, I feel like, so now you're going to get a chance to see them live. Yeah, I haven't seen them live in a couple years now. Uh, I'd love going out to the Pacific Northwest any yep. chance I get. So uh, 10.30 start time. These completely coasts. different team than Minnesota Gophers. Mm. A lot of young players on the field for Oregon. They have a lot of stud freshmen, a lot of explosive players yep. uh, mixed in with some veteran presence on the old line, Justin Herbert. So um, good 10 to 15 names of prospects on this Oregon team. Well, where, I mean, I, let's start with Herbert. What are, yeah. your, what are your thoughts on Herbert after studying him a little bit? Well, Herbert, I think, is going to be a scheme-specific type of quarterback. I don't think he's a plug-and-play in any system. Don't give this guy the keys to the franchise and say, go win us games. Mm -hmm. I think he needs to be in a Kubiak type of offense, a Shanahan type of offense. You know, a run-heavy team that you'll get him out on the perimeter and give him some separation from the offensive line, let him work some post-crosses and play-action concepts. But... Don't look at this guy and say, throw the ball 50 times and put up 400 yards. I don't see that type of player. Yep. I think he's got some functional mobility for a 6'6 player. A little bit the way Flacco came out of Delaware. Flacco turned into a stiff, but right uh, when he came out of college, Flacco had some mobility and some yeah. functional mobility. Yep. Those first couple years, they worked him on some play action boot a ton. No question. Which at 6'5, 6'6, he was fine doing that. He's got a big arm just like Herbert does. Um, you know, I've heard some other comps like Derek Anderson. I've tried to go back to the 90s to find, you know, some 6'5", six, 6'6 six, six guys like an Elvis Gerback with some good mobility that won a ton of games uh, out there in San Francisco and Kansas City. So, you know, he has all the tools. It's really going to come down to some of those meetings at the Combine, how yep. he is on the whiteboard and um, kind of his grasp of the game because there's some instances where he's big, he's tall, strong arm, can make all the throws. The processing, the progressions, when he's releasing balls in the routes, things like that. The real fine-tuned details Mm. that scouts and coordinators are going to start to, you know, really pick his brain on. I remember some of those meetings at Carson Wentz. You threw it here. Why? Why'd you throw it there? Why'd you throw it now? It's going to be those types of questions for him. And I'm not sure he's fully ready to understand and diagnose his own decision-making like that. And it's really going to get picked apart. Uh, once this offseason hits, but obviously has the tools, obviously has a skill set. What's he like between the ears? And I have a big category on my sheet of mental makeup. Yep. And that's where a lot of the question marks, I think, come into play. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting just to kind of follow that. To me, I don't see a situation where he's not in the top half of round one. Right. Uh, and when you talk about the teams that are picking in the top half of round one, you know, we talk about the, you know, there's that Shanahan scheme. Cincinnati with Zach Taylor coming from that tree. Mm-hmm. Denver, their offense coordinator that, that, just, that was just hired there this past offseason, he is from that tree. He was just uh, Shanahan's quarterback coach in San Francisco. So, uh, yeah, they just drafted Drew Locke last year in the second round. Right. But uh, mm-hmm. we'll see if that will keep them from taking a guy like Herbert, who I know John Elway was on the right. I think he saw – Herbert two or three times at least last year on he the did. road. So that's something to keep an eye and on. And two final takeaways of Herbert, and then we'll yeah. put him to bed because yes. we have a lot of players to get yes, to here. Yes, we do. Um, first of all, this guy got no help. None. I've seen drops on drops on drops. Led the Pac-12 last year with 30 drops uh, for quarterbacks. Tons of drops this year. I yep. feel like I see these beautiful throws, and it's like, oh, should have had that, or somebody could have made you'd that love, grab You'd for love him. for this to be caught, yep. Um, and then with the other thought of – I think Justin Herbert's a better quarterback than Jared Goff. Mm. You put Justin Herbert, the first overall pick in the 2016 draft, and give him three years with Sean McVay, I think he's in the Super Bowl last year. Right. So it's that type of mold, that type of offense, and if you get someone to say, let him come into my scheme and my structure, don't ask him to be the hero, he'll be a functional, effective quarterback that can win a lot of games. Yep. Who are we kidding? Jared Goff does not have an exceptional skill set. Smart kid, can make all the throws, Mm. strong arm, functional mobility. All the things we're saying about Herbert, you got to put him in the right system, in the right setting. And I think Jared Goff hit a home run with Sean McVay. Yep. I'm hoping Justin Herbert hits a home run with whoever takes him. No question. All right, well, let's get to some of the other guys on this Ducks team. Uh, Senior laden offensive lineman. um, You know, I think you look at their best prospect there might be the left tackle, Penny Sewell, who is not uh, eligible for this year's draft. I don't know if it's close. Yeah, yeah. he's really, really impressive on film. But uh, you look at Calvin Throckmorton, who's been a longtime right tackle, but has played up and down that line. Shane Lemieux, longtime left guard. 
Jake Hansen at center. Uh, Dallas Warmack, the brother of uh, former Eagles offensive lineman Chance Warmack, uh, Brady Aiello. Who kind of stands out and why? Yeah, the three, I think, cream of the crop of the group would be Shane Lemieux, Calvin Throckmorton, and Jake Hansen. Okay. Just quick little snapshots yep. in each of them. Jake Hansen I'm concerned with. was been on the field since true freshman year. Not a powerful guy. And also not really exceptional with those movement patterns mm. and quickness off the ball. So I'm a little bit concerned on where his fit is and what does he really hang his hat on for a skill set at the next level. Yep. Experienced player, veteran player, good hand usage, but I've written down not a people mover, no leverage, no yep. pop, doesn't fly out of stance. So I'm just worried about what is he going to excel at the next level. Shane Lemieux, interesting player, experience. I just think he's really limited with his skill set. I don't think he's exceptionally strong. I don't think he's exceptionally athletic. Uh, he has really good feet. He's a technically sound. Yep. He's a guy that I think will be that maybe eighth, ninth guy in the rotation, maybe have to kind of be a depth piece for a couple of years and the right situation maybe can do a spot duty. Kind of like a uh, Stefan Wisniewski. That okay. took a couple of years to find his way and then sure. became a really good what we've called in the offensive line world, hired guns mm. that could just step in in pretty much any position right. and survive. Yep. Exceptional, no, but survive, absolutely. Throckmorton's probably the most intriguing of the group. Has played every game at right tackle this year, started one at center. He's played right tackle, left tackle, center, right guard. It's remarkable. 47 career starts. He's had stretches of 1,000 snaps without a penalty. This guy's a people mover. He's powerful, heavy hands, anchors versus bull rushes, versatile, experienced, can play up and down the line. The one issue with him, athleticism, quickness, bend. I don't know if he's a zone scheme type of guy. He's probably mm. more of a gap scheme uh, type of offensive lineman, but a guy I think you want in your room just because of where he can line up up and down. It was great to see him over the summer at the O-line Masterminds as well. Yep. So somebody that clearly takes his craft uh, pretty seriously. Uh, they've got some other guys on offense as well. Jawan Johnson, a senior transfer from Penn State, big-bodied yep. kid, very productive. Last uh, the last time they took the field against USC, three yeah. touchdowns over 100 yards. Uh, uh, the running back, C.J. Fredell, has had some productive games so far. Jake Breland was be, was their really their number one passing threat. Now he's out for the year, unfortunately, at tight end. Uh, Breland looked like he was making some plays. But yeah. um, defensively, I want to get your thoughts because this is a team that, watching them, they fly around. It's a lot of fun to They're watch They're one of on the TV. best defensive units in the country. Yeah, You're just not fun. used to saying Ohio State, Alabama, LSU, Oregon. Right. You're used to thinking Oregon's offense, high power, Chip Kelly, Mariota, that whole deal. Yep. This is a defensive team. I know senior offensive line and stud quarterback is going to be a top 10 pick. This is a defensive team through and through, and I'd put this secondary up against anybody's in the country. You like uh, the, the junior corner, Diamador Lenore, Lenore. Yeah, really interesting player. He's 5'11", about 205, boundary corner. This is a thick, squatty corner, not really twitchy, not explosive. I question his long speed, but a great mix of strength and just having the athleticism and just enough speed to mm. survive. Uh, but he's not a guy that's a blazer. Really good in run support as a force defender. They don't play corners over, so meaning they don't flip their corners to the other side. He'll play on those closed formations. He'll contribute in the run game. Really likes to dictate the action at the line of scrimmage, in a release, on the break points. A lot like Iowa corner Desmond King a couple I years ago. He's turned into an all-pro nickel for the uh, Los Angeles Chargers. And then on the other side, complete different package corner in Thomas Graham Jr. Um, both juniors as well, so they can go back for their senior years if they'd like. But Thomas Graham, different type of player. He's the wiry, speedy, kind of more of a traditional outside corner at the next level. Mm. Seven career interceptions, 29 PBUs in his career. He had 18 PBUs last year. That's wild. Um, really, really big year uh, producting with ball skills. Loose, oily hips, the ball skills, click and close, long speed to run vertically. Just a small frame, so he could get kind of muscled at the catch point, get muscled uh, on releases here and there. Kind of like a Casey Hayward. Mm. I didn't really mean to go both charger comps there for them, but... It happens. That's how it works out. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, they, um, they, they, on top of interesting freshmen and sophomore yes. that aren't draft eligible, so right. that whole secondary very impressive. Uh, and then they've got some guys in that front seven as well. I mean, yeah, Troy Dye, senior linebacker, Jordan Scott, the big nose tackle. Yeah. Uh, Lamar Winston as well at linebacker. Who else stands out in that front seven? Pick one guy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Jordan Scott. Let's just talk about him for a second. He's a massive, massive run plugging nose tackle. So he's always there over the center. He's this dancing panda type of interior trench player. I thought he was just a two gapping run plugger yeah somebody letting troy die be free behind him this guy's stacking and shedding blocks getting off blocks for himself chasing plays to Love the it. number i really don't know where he is on the spectrum right now could he be a vince wilfork 
potentially. Mm. Could he be a Lewis Nix out of uh, Notre Dame a couple years ago right. who fizzled out immediately? Potentially. So I don't really know yet where he is on the NFL spectrum, but an interesting player, a stout player, a strong player, and a guy that's been on the field quite a bit. Yeah, it's that Oregon defense is a lot of fun to watch. Uh, real quick, just for the sake of time, a couple of Arizona names just to keep an eye on yeah. um, for everybody at home. Khalil <laughs> Tate and J.J. Taylor in that backfield. Yeah. Uh, a couple draft eligible guys. Tate's a senior, feels like he's been there forever, really athletic passer. Uh, people not sure what he's going to be at the next level uh, in terms of being a quarterback, is he a running back? Uh, J.J. Taylor, uh, I haven't studied him yet, but uh, has shown some dynamic playmaking ability as well over the course of his career. Mm-hmm. The guy I have studied is the senior, Jace Whitaker. He's in his sixth year. or He got an extra year of eligibility. Yep. Um, I see him as a future nickel. Not sure if he's going to be a starting nickel or if he's going to be like a fourth or fifth corner, um, but he's got some inside-out versatility. Instinctive player. He's just not like a height-weight speed guy, but I do like the competitiveness. So Yeah, a little bit light in the pants there. Yeah. Those guys at around 185. Yep. I want you to be a 4-4 player. Yep, I'm Once not sure he's that. Yeah, I don't see that either on tape, so I just get a little bit concerned uh, if you're undersized and you don't have the explosive speed. Yep, and we got some big matchups this week. Uh, you know, we've got Auburn and Georgia. We've got, obviously, your game's going to be a really interesting one. Um, We've got some really interesting games across the country. One matchup I'm excited to watch, Alabama try and get off the schneid here and prevent a losing streak uh, for the first time in however long. Don't let LSU uh, beat you twice. No, no question. Yeah. you got Mississippi State this week. That's secondary for Mississippi State's got some players. You know, Cam Dantzler is a player that uh, Tony Paulina said he uh, expects to declare for the draft. Yep. I watched Dantzler. Long, uh, wiry kid. Huge, yeah, huge, he, huge corner. He's the one that towers over the defensive back group. Yep. He's literally every bit of 6'2", if not 6'3". Movement skills are really impressive. Yep. So he, he's a guy to keep an eye on. And then also uh, the nickel, uh, Brian Cole, who yep. is actually going to the senior <clears> ball. So I wanted to bring him up. Michigan and talk transfer. About and yes. that defensive back group coached by Terrell Buckley, former NFL player. Oh, that's right. Yep. Uh, obviously a really good NFL uh, player. And just to kind of bring his experience to that group. Uh, pumped out a bunch of players in that secondary the yeah. past couple of years. Brian, so Brian Cole was at uh, season two of Last Chance U. He was down at Scuba, Mississippi uh, <laughs> for junior college, 6'2", <clears throat> 209. Like you said, Michigan transfer, former wide receiver, um, but big kid, quick. I like his ability to play in zone coverage, and he's tough. I just want to be able to see, is he a sideline to sideline guy? Does he have that kind of range? Uh, and also the ability to finish at the catch point uh, as a defensive player, that was a question they I They like had. to blitz him, too, off that slot yes, they position, do. and he comes he's a good with blitzer. a head of steam. Yep. He's a good blitzer. He's a lot of fun to watch. All right, uh, so we've already hit on, like, what, three or four or five uh, senior bowl guys. Yeah. Let's just kind of pound through the list. I'm going to go through because we've got a lot of names here. If there's anybody you feel strongly about, jump in, interrupt me, and say, like, all right, we've got to talk about this kid. Uh, first off, Brent, and we're basically we're going to do this mm-hmm. every week. Anybody that we talked about last week, obviously that was my line of demarcation. Everyone right. that was announced after we recorded, I put it here into the <clears> sheet. All right. Uh, Arizona State wide receiver Brandon Ayuk, six foot, 203. This kid's big. He's explosive. Junior college transfer, first-year starter. He was behind Nikhil Harry last year uh, in that offense, but still made some plays. I know he made some plays in the bowl game that you were at last year. I want to continue to watch more. He reminds me a little bit of like a Sammy Watkins, Cordero Patterson, uh, bigger body, good yards after catch with some dynamic playmaking ability. I think he's going to kind of come on radars the way Darius Slayton has for the New York Giants. Yeah. Absolute speedster in Auburn. This guy isn't just fast. He is elite fast. He's yep. a track star playing receiver out there. He's got... 17 yards per catch on yep. like 30 or 40 catches this year, so big play threat. The thing he's got going for him now is he's going to Senior Bowl. Slayton was a junior, wasn't at that game, so there he's go. got the ability to kind of boost his stock. Yep. Uh, he's going to be one of the faster players down in Mobile. No, no question. question. Yep. Absolutely. So uh, a couple other receivers. I'll kind of group these two guys together. Uh, South Carolina's got Brian Edwards, 6'3", 218. USC, Michael Pittman, 6'4", 223. So two big-bodied guys, two guys that you've seen in person this year. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's talk about how, just kind of juxtapose those two guys next to each other. Brian Edwards versus Michael Pittman. Yeah, Brian Edwards, route running technician, a variety of releases, yep. gets in and out of breaks really well, long player, a little bit inconsistent down the field, tracking the ball, has made some tough catches in mm. traffic, and then he's had some boneheaded drops. Really good yak immediately after the catch as well. Uh, Michael Pittman's more of a catch point guy, a guy yep. that's not getting himself open within the route, but a guy with good balance, winning like a low post basketball player, adjustments, back shoulders, high point, red zone. Special teams. Yep, no question. I think that's perfectly said on those yep. guys. Uh, one tight end I want to hit on. Guy you and I watched last week yeah, together. Fun uh, player. No question. That's Adam Troutman from Dayton, 6'5, 256. Just a well rounded player. No like, question. Not, yep. You're checking a lot of boxes with that kid. Outside of the level of competition, I think uh, his releases off the line of scrimmage can get a little bit better. Mm-hmm. After that, man, I mean, you're checking every box. Like, 
good blocker, good route runner, really good at the catch point, yep. yards after catch. He's not like super dynamic as that. He's not like a, a Dallas Goddard level level of athlete or Travis Kelsey level of athlete. But he's a good player. They think so, at least. That's because how they, they, treat him, yes. they feature him in the offense. He's the one that they're leaking vertically. He's the one they're trying to get on double moves and on throwback plays, uh, on play action. And it's funny you mentioned the releases. Actually, we noted a bunch of times his releases when run blocking. Mm. Fires off the ball extremely yes. well, gets himself in position. He's not an overpowering guy. He's 6'5", 250. He's not a people mover, but he's a technically sound player. Mm. Gets his hands and hat in the right spot. Plays with a really good base, and he survives. Yep. And I think you have a tight end that can survive in the run game with the athletic upside in the pass game we're looking at a day two player here I that think can so. really contribute nope. I think my comp was a Tony Scheffler for yep. those that remember that like with that the Denver lot. Broncos and the uh, Detroit Lions sure and so then uh, next up I've got they got a bunch of offensive linemen that have been announced sure. I kind of grouped these guys together three really athletic you know quote unquote left tackle types all right we're gonna go Josh Jones from mm-hmm. Houston uh, you and I watched them together I love Josh Jones like this guy I think could be could be a first round pick I think when it's all said and done, there's some names that are a little bit slow to kind of work their way up to the top of draft boards right yep. now. Josh Jones is going to be a first-round player. Yeah. On top of, I know we're veering off here, with yeah. these Alabama tackles right. I think are going to be first-rounders as well. They're, yep. they're only juniors right now. But I think the, dra- the draft trajectory and where their stock is, once we start digging into Josh Jones' tape and once he goes and puts on a clinic down at the Combine – or excuse me, at the Senior Bowl. He'll we'll do it at the Combine, too. At the Combine, Senior yep. Bowl. A lot like the way uh, Andre Dillard kind of came on last year. Titus Howard did it last no year. Question. Chris Lindstrom did you it show last year. You up to the year. Senior Bowl, you're as naked as you can be in one on one yep. It's me and you. What do we got? And I think he's going to look really good. He gave us very little uh, on tape to not like. I think his tape was better than Titus. And I liked Titus Howard a year ago mm-hmm. at Alabama State. I think his tape's better. Yep. Uh, I think they're comparable athletes. Yeah. I mean, Josh Titus, Jones is a good Titus Howard, you saw that one game against Auburn, and yep. he put a lot of stock into that. Yep. Houston, he's got some some more valuable tape, in my opinion. Yeah. He played Oklahoma this year. Played you know. Oklahoma, Washington State. They've got some good talent in the AAC as well. No question. So, yep. uh, there's some good tape there for Josh Jones, a player that I am really high on coming into this process. Uh, Prince Tegawanogo from Auburn, 6'5", 307. Another kid, a high school defensive end. He's got that athletic background. Hasn't played a ton of football. I don't believe he played until he got to high school, um, but really athletic, really, mm-hmm. really natural mover. Just needs to be a little bit more refined and develop a little bit more power. Yeah, I was really impressed with his hand usage. Yeah. He's one of these guys that's already uh, pass protecting with his hands independently. He's not a robot. He's a guy that really kind of mirrors pass rushers and can you know uh, attack a variety of uh, rush moves. So mm-hmm. interesting player, huge hands, huge feet, strong yep. player. Uh, just really needs to refine the technique. So and I don't believe you've watched this kid, the UConn tackle, Matt Pert. Nope. He's played both left and right tackle over the course of his career. Another guy who didn't play football until his high school, uh, his high school year, I believe. He is from Jamaica uh, initially and moved to moved to the states. Uh, really athletic kid. He's strong to take on a bull rush. Not powerful. Need to be a little bit more consistent with his base and his use of hands and things like that. But uh, this the kid's pretty impressive and he's a big kid, six six seven, little uh, over three hundred. Well, just pounds. go right to your next name too because I just think it's interesting that these guys play the same position in two completely different packages. So Tremaine Ankrum, the Clemson Tremaine kid. Ankrum, who does not look like your typical offensive tackle in the yep. NFL. A little bit shorter, a little bit squattier than you would think, more like the Charles Leno. No question. Uh, 6'2", 6'3", Marshall Newhouse, 6'2", 6'3". But Ankrum, Ankrum, aside from his length and measurables, really doesn't say a whole lot on the tape to say, oh, we got to move him inside. He struggles with length. He struggles running the arc. You know, his arms aren't long enough. Yep. I'm going to let him feast or famine on the edge first. And if I have to slide him in after, so be it. He's a he's a natural pass protector. Yeah. We've and talked the, about the him UConn on the show. The UConn kid, 6'7", his yep. arms down to his knees. I think he's got an 86-inch wingspan. So just funny to look at guys that play the same position, yep. do it in a completely different package. So a couple of guys that are uh, offensive guards that are, you know, big physical maulers. John Simpson uh, from Clemson, his teammate for, there for Ankrum. Uh, big, strong kid, 6'5", threw over 330 pounds. And then Kentucky's Logan Stenberg, kind of a, built in a similar package, 6'6", over 320 pounds. Both guys mm-hmm. really thrive on uh, strength and power and toughness inside, longtime starters. You just question, do they have the athletic upside to say, like, all right, can they? are they good enough to be able to last in the NFL? I think that's the question. Yeah, I don't uh, remember watching guys. the Kentucky kid. I'm trying to think of my Benny Snell notes, if mm-hmm. anyone uh, stood out last year. But he's, he's a guy I don't think I've seen a play yeah, of Yeah, he's been the left guard for them for, for a little bit, Logan Stenberg. Gotcha. Uh, Michigan's uh, Ben Bredesen, you got to yep. see him a couple times. 
several times. Uh, I haven't watched Bredesen yet. Six four, uh, three hundred and thirty pounds, three thirty. I don't know if you've watched or if you've got no. I did. Time I don't remember. I think he's a really experienced player. I yeah. think he's got like twenty five hundred snaps under his belt at this point. So yep. a guy that's been on the field a ton. Yeah, two times second team All Big Ten coming into the season. Yeah. Then we got a bunch of Big Twelve offensive linemen, which you wouldn't necessarily expect. But uh, here we go. We got West Virginia left tackle Colton McK- or right tackle Colton McKivitz, yep. six six three ten. Watched him last year with Yadni Kajus, and I kind of like McKivitz a little bit more. Yeah, that was kind of the consensus of that yeah. group. Yeah, uh, I think so. I mean, this was an All State basketball player in high school, athletic kid, pretty light feet. Needed to see him get a little bit stronger. I haven't watched him this year. Uh, excited to get in, get into his tape. Then we've got a kid that you saw uh, a couple weeks ago, yep. Kansas's uh, Hakeem Adeniji, six four three zero three. Another guy that looks the part, long arms, tall. Yep. You just want to see what he can do against higher competition, maybe in a different scheme down there in Kansas. Les Miles came in, thought about sliding him into guard, even took some reps at center in right. the summer, eventually went back to his left tackle spot. But he's one of these players, I know scouts just want to poke and pop, prod mm. kind of up close just to see what else can you do for us. And then we got uh, Texas Tech, their tackle, Terrence Steele. Yep, another guy, huge wings fan. Crazy yep. length. Uh, you know, he's just, he's very unrefined. So mm-hmm. this, is, this is a kind of a moldable uh, ball of clay that you're kind of working That's with That's funny, there. his measurables, and I'm just flashing back to other guys from Texas Tech. Um, the kid that was the third round pick for the Colts. Cl- Lorraine Clark. 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 Yes. Right. Long, long yes. arms. That's like, how they he, like him there. He could tie his shoes, not yep. bending over. Uh, yep. One of those guys. That goes but. back to Mike. Mike Leach likes those big, long guys. They, right. you know, they with the they they play with uh, such wide splits. They just say, right. you know what, like try and run around us. But Go it's great. It. You wake up in the morning with those tools. Right. How do you use them? Yep. Laraven Clark, typical waist bender, and I'm not even sure if he's in the in the league anymore because of that technique so. flaw. Yep. Uh, real quickly, one last offensive lineman from St. John's. Ben Bartsch, you and I watched him late last week. Yeah. Uh, not often that we're watching uh, St. John's. Well, I'll tell you what, you put on that Gustavus Adolphus tape, and he just <laughs> stands out watch, to you. Yeah. You know, he just he just stands out. You'll, your your eyes will find him when you put on that tape. Uh, former tight end, he's athletic. He's pretty he's pretty uh, sound in pass pro. I mean, it seems really natural there. It's just so hard to evaluate. So, like, the senior bowl is going to be huge for him. We've seen this with guys that have come from that level. Uh, Alex Kappa yep. and um, uh, who are they? Ali Marpet. Uh, oh, Ali Marpet, yep. exactly. So we've seen uh, guys come from that level, go to the senior bowl, and help themselves. I think he's going to be in I that I love boat. that Nagy in the senior bowl and even, you know, uh, pre-Nagy era, that they get guys from D1, yep. D2, D3, FCS, NAIA, wherever you are. Yep. Play your game. There's plenty of guys on this list that just made the senior bowl that weren't even on the watch list. Right. And the watch list has, like, 500 players. Yep. So don't get discouraged if you're not on the watch list. Stick to your game. Play your game. I promise you the scouts will find you. All right, let's go to some pass rushers here. Uh, Florida's defensive lineman Jabari Zaniga. We've mm-hmm. been talking about him for yep. a couple of years now. 6'4", 255. He's been a little banged up this year. Give yeah. us your elevator speech on Zaniga. Yeah, really good football player. A guy that can slide into three tech and some sub packages. Good run defender. He's a guy that kind of showed a little bit more bend off the edge than I thought he could. Mm-hmm. Last year, Ja'Kai Polite stole a lot of the thunder being the uh, quarterback terror off the edge. He he was a better football player, though. I know he's been banged up this yep. year. Um, they got the Louisville kid over there on the other side of him. Mm. Also been banged up here and there. But Zaniga's a really good football player. Two things I really like about him. He's very violent, and yep. he's great on stunts up yeah. front. Really, really effective uh, in that kind of scheme. I think my comp for him for the last couple of years has been Carl Lawson. Yep. Just that little bit of a squadier type of edge player that can slide inside, and a really physical, violent player. Okay. Week one, Florida matched up with Miami, and they had a transfer there and Trayvon Hill right. from Virginia Tech. Right. Trayvon Hill also accepted for the senior bowl. This kid is explosive. Really quick first step. Wide variety of pass rush moves. You got to kind of investigate what happened there at Virginia Tech because mm-hmm. he has all that stuff behind him. Um, needs to get a little bit stronger. He's only 238. But this kid's explosive. Like win wow. Yeah, he's okay. a, but he can get after in a lot of different ways. So really impressive player. Um, kind of similar in some ways, I would say, to what Josh Uche. And yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, you watched, you saw him up close and watched him on film. I finished up my my pre Senior Bowl evaluation on last week. We got got together this week and we said, you know, I watched Uche, and you said the same player that I wrote down. I don't know if it's just a recency bias. It might and that be. We've been it's, watching it's, him, it's, and his name's kind of been in the forefront of our mind here. These undersized outside linebacker, pass rushing, chess piece type of player, but we both looked at each other and said Jannard Avery, no question. who just uh, showed up here to the Philadelphia Eagles and has been worked in on some third down pressure packages. Not sure his fundamental role in some base packages early downs. Yeah. 
but he's a guy that might be a mid to late round pick that's going to work in some pressure packages on third down. Just let him go. No like, question. Just let him yep. chase the quarterback. Uh, he's a chess piece you want to get on third down, but yep. where is his functional usage on early downs? I'm not really sure yet. Uh, you couldn't talk about a d- more different body type from Josh Uche than from Marlon Davidson, yep, uh, the defensive yeah. lineman from Auburn, who's over 285, and I think some people kind of view him as he a developmental three technique, uh, but this is a big, thick, wide body who uh, is really strong, really tough. You just wonder, okay, what kind of... At- a pass rush upside does he give you off the edge? Right. Uh-huh. Um, a guy that you kind of think is playing out of position there. Yep. Might be a guy that will slide in and maybe be a three tech, you know, yep. an under tackle in the NFL. Uh, South Carolina, another edge there. Uh, DJ Wanham, 6'5", 252. I studied him in the summer. Uh, one thing I really liked, really high motor. He was also really banged up last year, mm-hmm. so I'm excited to kind of get eyes on him this year fully healthy. I've watched a lot of Javon Kinlaw, who right. we might as well talk about him as well. Uh, he's going to the Senior Bowl. I've watched a lot of Kinlaw. Wasn't focused on Wanham because I just wanted to really lock in on Kinlaw, mm-hmm. uh, but excited to see him fully healthy. Yeah, I did the uh, one South Carolina game this year against Florida. Yep. Wanham had a great game, had a sack there, a couple pressures as well, really good run defender, and it it's him and Kinlaw kind of leading the warm-ups and leading the team. So two senior players on that South Carolina defense, two experienced players, and I think they're playing their best football heading into their senior year. Kinlaw lost some weight coming from last year to this year, yeah. so he's tried to get a little bit quicker. My one question, I really like he him. He apparently he's, had a hip injury as well, too, that he got right. taken care of in the summer. That's a good point. Yep. Uh, he's a guy that I think... Look, he's really stout on contact. His, the, losing the weight has kind of given him... He's, you know, There's some give and take there, so he's getting moved a little bit more this year. Um... I just for defensive tackles, we're gonna say okay, like this is this this is a guy who's gonna be an elite defensive tackle. Can you win quickly? And I think you could say that with Kinlaw. The next guy we're gonna talk about, Neville Gallimore. Yep. I think he, I think Gallimore uh, from Oklahoma, who's also going. You know, do they? Mm-hmm. Can either of those guys win quickly? And if you're not a guy that's gonna win quickly, you know, if you're a slow burn pass rusher, you could be a great run defender, and you know, you can win with your hands. But you know, you and I have had this discussion. You look at who we we would refer to as the elite defensive tackles, the elite interior defensive linemen: Aaron Donald, Fletcher Cox, DeForest Buckner, Grady Jarrett, Geno Atkins, Chris Jones. All those guys win quickly inside. Mm -hmm. That'll be the question. I think these guys go to the Senior Bowl, prove you know whether it's one on ones or team drills or in the game that you can win quickly as a pass rusher, and now see your draft stock go high. Yeah, absolutely. I see that next guy on your list, and I think the problem with this guy and Neville Gallimore is. All he does is win quickly. Mm. I need him to finish more right. plays yeah. after that first step, yep. after that get off, after your initial move. I need you to hunt quarterbacks and finish plays out to the numbers and things like that. And that's kind of Gerald McCoy. And it's funny hearing mm. Gerald McCoy at Hard Knocks a couple of years ago talk about his get off. And he knows that's all he has. Right. If I don't win with my get off, I can't play. And just to see him go through his routine of his first step and working on his technique. That's Neville Gallimore. He's got the get-off. He's got the disruption. He needs to finish plays like Gerald McCoy finished plays. Mm, yeah, and I think uh, in Gallimore, like Ken Law, has lost some weight coming into this year. Yes, uh, he's down to un- under Interesting story, too. Canadian yes. player, too. Not a traditional kind of football. football American upbringing. Soccer, and, volleyball, basketball. Yep, good he played footwork. He's yep. a guy that obviously he might have his best football ahead of him might. if he gets the right defensive line coach no at the question. next level. Uh, Jason Strobridge from yep. uh, Love North Carolina. Kid. Love watching this uh, kid. This kid, does no, no worries about him winning quickly. No. It's more of the other side, all right, does he have enough sand in his pants to be able to hold up in the run game? Yeah, and he plays a little bit tall in the trenches there, you yep. know, so he obviously wants to get after quarterbacks on third down, but in the run game, needs to lower his pads a little bit, tries to run around people a little bit too much. He's twitchy, he's explosive, he's athletic for a trench player, um, just needs to hold his ground a little bit more. I wrote down Jerry Tillery while watching him. That's a great comp. Yeah. You know, you could see the length, you could see the upside in the pass game, and you have the same question marks of pad level height in the run game. Yep. Uh, let's go to linebacker now. A couple guys, uh, both from somewhat out west. So we'll talk with uh, Utah linebacker Francis Bernard, which uh, you sent me the text yesterday with a screen grab saying that Bernard went, and it was just, I was in a meeting. Yeah. I'm in a meeting. I'm, in a, I'm, I'm trying to keep things together. <laughs> Quick fist pump, right. and everyone's looking at me. I'm like, don't worry about it. <laughs> Francis Bernard's a guy I've been high on since the summer. No question. You put you told me to watch the tape in the summer. You said, you know this Francis Bernard kid? I said, no. Who's that? <laughs> I said, the Utah linebacker. Oh, you mean uh, Chase Hansen and Cody... Uh, Cody Barton. Cody Barton. No, no, the guy behind, behind him. those guys. BYU transfer showed up to uh, Utah and got stuck behind those two senior linebackers who were yep. great players. But Bernard just got on the field late last year, and he immediately shows out athleticism, linear speed, violence, 
aggression, yep. physicality, the whole package that you want from an off-the-ball linebacker. I don't really have a comp yet because he's such a mix of a bunch of players, yeah. um, but a really explosive player and an absolute playmaker in the nucleus of the defense. Yeah, I think uh, the other guy we'll talk about, not quite as athletic, but he's been very productive this year, and that's Jordan Brooks from Texas Tech, six foot, 241. He's long. He's got a little bit of that linear burst that you're looking for to close and eat up ground quickly. He reads the run really quickly, and he's also uh, been very productive. He's led the team in tackles two of the last three years, but I do wonder a little bit about him in coverage, and he needs to be a little bit more consistent as a tackler overall. And I just wrote down Francis Bernard comps yesterday. I want to Oh, you're Hold gonna, up, because I because I, I thought I had a really good one that I was proud of. Oh, is it? it uh, it's not going to be uh, our guy that's out in San Francisco right now. Um, Taylor, uh, Fred Warner. No, it's not Fred Warner. It's a good one though. Oh, no. BYU yes. linebacker. So the names I have written down right now are Lofa Tatupo Ooh. and Navarro Bowman. Whoa. All right. Well. So two kind of different package yeah. linebackers there, but guys that were physical, nasty, and that could run and had an explosive step to them. Interesting. And I think, I think that's going to be him. All right. Well, let's get to the secondary now. We've got five more names here uh, to knock out. Two corners, both from the Big 12. One I've watched extensively. The other I have not watched a lick of. But okay. you, but I know you've seen, so you can give uh, give us a, an elevator speech on Jeff Gladney from TCU. He's undersized. He's 5'10", 183. Love to watch him. Yeah, he's been on my radar. He's been on my list all summer, and I just haven't gotten to it yet. Dude, he is so much fun to watch because yeah. he's really quick. He's really instinctive. He reads routes really well, especially from zone coverage. He finishes on the ball well, and he's so competitive. Like I watched him against Texas this year, and he was matched up with Colin Johnson. Mm-hmm. Again, 5'10", yep. 183. Colin Johnson, 6'5", 228. Yep. This guy battled. He gave up a couple catches, but he battled okay. with him every we'll single down. Game. Loved, okay. loved watching him against Texas. Um, but size, strength, long speed. He's been reported in like the four threes. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know if he's 4'3". Like watching him, I don't know that he's 4'3". So I think watching him uh, at the senior bowl will be big. Just kind of iron out exa- everything that we've seen from him on film. Go to the combine and see what he runs. I think that'll uh, help him a lot okay. uh, in terms of his stock. But tell us about uh, the other Big 12 kid, Oklahoma State's A.J. Green. Well, he reminds me a lot of another Big 12 corner, our okay. own Rasul Douglas here from West oh, Virginia. That, right. More of the upright 6'1", 6'2", corner, plays a lot of off-man stuff, really competitive at the catch point, can turn and run with his length and his speed. Doesn't play a whole lot of press man out there, but mm. a guy with good ball skills, good length. Uh, and a guy I think is going to have to kind of show what he can do in press coverage at the Senior Bowl, and that's mm. really what that event is all about. Maybe to show some scouts some things I wasn't asked to do at Oklahoma State. Right. It's not that he can't do it. He just wasn't asked to do it. No so question. let's put him in a different atmosphere here. Let's make him uncomfortable, and let's see what he can do. Uh, three safeties left. One is a former corner, and that's Utah's Julian Blackman. Mm-hmm. Uh, high school wide receiver in corner. Started yep. it with the Utah corner this year. Moved to safety. Six foot. 180, which yeah. that's that's on the lighter side for a safety, but uh, you love the corner background. Yeah, uh, definitely has the ball skills there. Moved over to safety this year, but having those safeties that can cover, mm-hmm. I think that's what the NFL wants now in their sub package. They don't just want that small corner sliding in the nickel. You want that safety with coverage skills being your new nickel that yep. can contribute and run support, be a blitzer, guard these big tight ends, guard these slot receivers, guard the middle of the field, play the back end. I think that's Julian Blackman. I think he's going to test really well. He's a guy with ball skills skills and he's going to get his name put into the safety class Mm. but he's a corner right so I think he's going to kind of move himself up in that safety group just by being grouped in with some other players that maybe don't have the true cornerback skill set uh two safeties left from the midwest Mm -hmm. both guys I think are probably better served being a little bit closer to the line of scrimmage overall I have not watched Josh Medalist yet from Michigan but I know you saw him a couple weeks ago yeah he's actually a pretty rangy kid from what I remember yeah he could play the back end he's had a couple plays uh from the middle of the field almost out to the side I like that I didn't know so I thought I Um, the book on him, I thought, was that he was more of a strong safety type. No, he's more of that back-end player. Cleeky Hudson's the guy that kind of came down right. to the box there. But okay. uh, he's a guy with long arms. He looks like that rangy player. He's kind of like the Deontay Thompson. Okay. Uh, is that his name? From Deontay Boise Thompson? State, yeah. right. No, uh, who's oh, from Alabama. Alabama. Yeah, 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 yeah. Last year, Deontay yeah. Thompson? They're bo- are they both? No, Darian Thompson was Boise State. Right, yeah, right. So For some Deontay, Deontay Thompson, Thompson, Thompson last just year. isn't sounding right saying it. Yeah, that's right, though. I can't I think tell you what right. team he went to. I know he get, he really fell on he draft fell day. He fell on draft day. But anyways, yeah. that type of player on the back end. Interesting, okay. Um, and then Notre Dame safety there, huh? Yeah, Jalen El- Jalen Elliott is a senior, six foot two oh seven. He got accepted to the game, I think, on Monday or, or Tuesday. Okay. Um, but I think when Jalen Elliott, he's big, he's long. I like his eyes and zone coverage. So, like, underneath, if he's a robber or if he's a curl flat player or a hook player, I like him in that role. 
I don't want him in the post. Um, I'd like to see him be more consistent as a tackler. That was like my big bugaboo with him was, look, you, if you're not rangy, you're not super athletic, like I can find a spot for you in some sub packages and down mm-hmm. close to the line of scrimmage, but I need you to be a good tackler if that's that's your role. So you can't be both. And then that's kind of the There's question. There's so many interesting safeties around the country this year. From There's like Xavier McKinney and Tanner Muse and obviously the Dude, whole McKinney was all over the place on Saturday against LSU. He had like two sacks. He's flying off the edge. He's making plays in coverage. Like, I haven't studied him yet, but right. he flashed in that game against LSU. Like there's these safeties all over the country I want to dig into. Yep. And obviously the Grant Delpits of the world yes. and those types of guys. But um, interesting group. <sighs> Dude, I'm like exhausted. Like, right. I, like, it's such like an exciting games. time, though. I know. I you know, love it. Now we're getting into the national title picture. Everybody's looking at the yep. playoff rankings, bowl game projections. The all-star game lineups are coming out now. Players are going to start declaring. Players are going to say they're coming back. Yep. A couple late season injuries. Some freshmen are going to come up and maybe, you know, potentially burn some red shirts. Just a really interesting kind of uh, weird evolving time in college football. You mentioned the playoffs really quickly. We're going to get an Alabama LSU rematch in the first round of the college football playoff. You think so? I'm calling it right now. Okay. Because here's what's going to happen. Uh, everyone's going to, if, if chalk holds out, even if Oregon beats Utah in the Pac-12 title, and everyone says, oh, you know, they've won 11 straight or 12 straight mm-hmm. and they just beat Utah, that's a quality win. They've got that common opponent and if Alabama blows the doors off Auburn, who beat Oregon, and we even though it was week one, right. that's going to be all the committee needs and say, oh, Tua was banged up against LSU. They went down to the wire. They crushed Auburn. Even though they didn't get a conference title game, Alabama's going to go in. They're going to go to number four. I just feel like the court of public opinion is going to put so much stress on that SEC championship game yeah. and what happens. LSU can run the table, but what if they get crushed in that, that game? That would be the thing that's that would That's going to be the recency yes. feel to their Georgia team. Georgia would then stay in four. Yeah, no question. Wouldn't be able and to then Georgia out. would have one loss. LSU yep. would have one loss. Alabama, potentially, if they run the table, would have one loss. Yep. Everybody's going to be coming off thinking, let's just say, theoretically, LSU gets crushed in that game. Yes. Suddenly, is Bama closer to LSU? Yep. You know, and it's just just creates a really kind of... That's right. Weird if everything goes it. as planned, you know, unless like the other thing would be if like Minnesota runs the table and beats Ohio State in the Big Ten title, too, like that yep. would be the other thing to throw it off. But if everything else held true, Alabama beats Auburn, and everybody else, I think that. And I don't see anybody uh, giving Clemson any trouble at this point. I don't think so. I thought Wake might over but ruffled them, but now. they just lost last week and Sage Surratt done for the year. <sighs> We got a lot more to talk about next week. I'm yeah. sure we'll have another. You know, I want to run back to my desk and see what other uh, guys accepted the senior. Yeah, I'm sure like three more guys right. since we started the conversation have accepted. But uh, Ben, appreciate it, and we'll talk to you next week here on Saturday Scouting. Well, we covered a ton of players there with Ben, and you can follow Ben on Twitter at Ben Fennel underscore NFL. Uh, he does a great job helping us out each and every week on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, Eagle Eye in the Sky articles, uh, Eagles game plan as well. You can catch that uh, this week on PhiladelphiaEagles.com, the Eagles mobile app, uh, and also the Eagles YouTube page, wherever you may be watching uh, this podcast. But uh, let's get now into the next part of the show. Really, really excited to welcome in Andy Weidel, the Vice President, President of Player Personnel for the Philadelphia Eagles uh, in his first year. Uh, Uh, in the role, taking over for Joe Douglas. A lot to talk about here with Andy. Let's get to that now in Mr. Relevant. It's time for Mr. Relevant. We're really excited to be welcoming in uh, Eagles Vice President of Player Personnel, Andy Weidel. Andy, welcome to the show, man. Fran, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, real quick, before we kind of dive into the process and what's going on around the league right now with all 32 teams, I got to ask you first, uh, it's your first season now in your, in your new role. What, what has it been like? What, how has it changed uh, from years past into what you're doing now? Right. Well, this, this year I'm more involved you know, mm-hmm. directly with Howie, uh, with Coach Peterson, in uh, the day-to-day operation, roster management. In years past, I was there with Joe. Um, you know, I was the director of player personnel, assistant director of player personnel in prior seasons. So uh, this year, I'm in that chair that Joe was in, and um, you know, being involved with the scouts, communicating on a daily brace, basis with our pro department and our college department, and uh, just making sure we're all headed in the right direction. Sure. So is it a? Uh, is it? Almost is it tough to kind of walk away from the, the the film aspect of it from like every day kind of getting nitty gritty and kind of focusing on the team here and now, or is it has that part changed at all for you uh, moving into that transition? Well, you, you got to stay involved and uh, you know day to day being at being at practice every day is a big priority, mm. and uh, just the fifty three man roster, the ten man practice squad, just staying on top of it and uh, that operation. But you got to go back to the tape. You got to yeah. go see the players still yeah. in college. Um, we always say you got to go see them. They're not going to come find you. So um, it's a challenge. It's uh, definitely being more efficient with your time, you know, in terms of how you delegate. 
Uh, but I love it. It's a great role. I have a great group of scouts, pro department and uh, college department. And, um, you know, they, we just make sure we're aligned and we're an extension of the coaching staff and we're all pulling in the same direction. So uh, take us through uh, the bye week this past week. What was it like for you not having to worry about, you know, the Eagles playing a game? A lot of great games around the NFL, a lot of great games in college this past week. What, what was life like for you? Uh, did you have to go to a game this week? Did you get, or you get to enjoy the action uh, from home? You know, I'll be, I'll be uh, honest. I, was, uh, I went back to Pittsburgh and nice. was with my dad and my, my dad and my five-year-old son. We watched the LSU-Alabama game. That's awesome. And uh, it was great doing some TV scouting. <laughs> and uh, it was one of the best college games I've seen in a while. Yeah. And there's a lot, a lot of talent on the field on both sides. And uh, just taking it all in, it, it was awesome to watch and just sit back and, and uh, relax and then watch the game last night, the Minnesota-Dallas yep. game. Uh, stayed up to watch that to the end. That was great football as well. Mm. So um, it's exciting sitting here today, five and four, with seven to go, and uh, the opportunity with everything in front of us. All right, well, give us a, a peek behind the curtain and you know what all 32 teams are kind of going through right now in terms of the process. We're almost near the end of the, of the college football regular season, which is crazy to say. What's happening around the league right now in terms of teams with their college scouts? Everybody's out on the road, but what happens over the next few weeks? Right, so everybody, we're coming down the home stretch for the fall scouting. We always say this is the this is the main part of the resume for the player, what they put in the uh, the tape in the fall. So scouts are, are getting late tape in. They're going in for final visits on big schools. Um, you know, keeping the, the, the background information, it's fluid. Uh, it'll be fluid all the way up till the draft. So they're uh, getting ready for a deadline coming in early December. And then we'll bring our scouts in and we will sit and have a top 30 meeting. And we'll sit down with each of our area scouts and we'll go over the list of top 30 players from the fall. And that will be how we rank and start our initial board um, heading through the process and into the off season. So the whole idea that right now, I think, you know, in the media, we say oh, this guy's rising up boards or falling down boards. For most, like boards aren't even established yet, right? That, that doesn't really get created until later this year. Right. That, that'll be established for us, the initial one of December. Right. Uh, we actually do spring scouting as well yep. from last year. We'll, do, we'll cover 80-plus schools in the spring, and it gives our scouts a head start on players and a fuller picture of a player. And uh, it can be really beneficial when you have a player, a junior, that had a really good junior year, and his senior year maybe something happened, injury, personal-wise, but you can go back and fall back and look at the, the junior tape and uh, get a bigger picture of the player and their ability. And sometimes you can catch a falling star in a draft right. through that also. So we like to do that also uh, just to get extra work done. And, um, but this, this December meeting coming up will be the initial board set. For the area scouts, I got to think this is, isn't too hard because they're so involved with where they're at any given day. When you look at it from a big picture standpoint, you know who the big players are around the, course, around the country. Is it hard to kind of not go with the ebb and flow of college season and react to each game as an, in a vacuum? Like, oh, you know, just Justin Herbert threw three picks this week. Oh, now he threw six touchdowns. Now he's the number one quarterback again. I feel like in the media, it's so easy to kind of ride that wave. Looking at a big picture from the inside, is it is it a hard or is it easy or is it just not even come up because you have so many things that you have to worry about? Right. Well, you got to go with the feel, yeah. what your instinct is on a player. And, uh, you know, everything with context within a game, Things happen, and I think the, the big picture on players, the full picture, that's the main thing. And uh, as we always say, we want to know the main thing for us is we, we all see the tape and, and can see the ability, but it's who we're getting when they walk through the door, the player. Do they yep. fit the culture? Um, are they our type of player? And um, our guys, we're an extension of the coaching staff, and we're just looking to add players here that fit what we do in our culture uh, that's been established by Coach Peterson and Howie, and uh, that's the most important thing. So um, our culture is different, we feel. Uh, the type of player we bring in here is unique. And um, you know, the challenge for our scouts and for us is to find those guys. So we've had a lot of our area scouts on the show over the past, uh, we'll say over the past calendar year. We've had Anthony Patch, we've had Pat Stewart, we've had uh, Jim Ward, a whole, a whole, pretty much everybody's been on. From your perspective, what is something when you're on the road and you're seeing these guys in person, what is something that you're trying to take away that you know maybe we don't see on TV, you don't see on film, uh, but you can see it live and in person? Well, I think one of the things is when you get there early, you see them in warm-ups, how the player does, what they come out, how they warm up on the field, the leadership, the leadership on the sideline, things you can't tell off a of mm. tape, um, how they interact with their teammates. Those are all big things. Uh, the body type, obviously, uh, room for growth. There's a lot of things, but I think right off, off the bat, those are things that jump off. You know, mm -hmm. the energy they play with in the tempo, are they the leader um, of their group? You know, there's, there's a lot of things you can take away in, in warm-ups, 
um, and watching the course of the game, the interaction on the sideline that mm-hmm. you can't see when you just throw on a videotape. Sure. So those are the benefits of going to the live action. What's uh, your favorite part of the process? Is it this part right now? I love watching the tape, but yeah. I think also it's getting to know the players. Yeah. When we have the interviews at the Combine and we bring them in here and getting to know the personality mm. um, and finding, as we say, eagles. Yep. You know, we, that, that's the challenge. We want to find eagles, guys uh, that are our type of people, um, you know, w- with their background, their personalities. Uh, that's the best part because mm. at the end, this is a people business. Yep. And um, the personality, the person, the guy you're getting when they come through the door, that's just as important as the ability. So we're talking a lot, I spent a lot of time in this show talking about the initial round of acceptances for the Senior Bowl. That'll be one of the first cases where you'll get to talk to some of these guys in person. Do you not talk, do you hash that out once you guys get together in December about, okay, we'll take a look at those lists, or is that something that doesn't get touched even until you're getting ready to head down to Mobile? Right, well, it's, it's a strategic list we put together. Yeah. Guys we want to spend more time with, uh, we can do that down in Mobile. Yep. Maybe get 15 guys done, knocked out down there. And there's no time constraint. The combine, you get 15 minutes, yep. right? So we got to use that time. I mean, we, we get them in there and we got our questions and we hit them and we go. Um, down there, we hit them, but you, a little bit more time. Mm. You know, it's, um, you're, not, you're not under the constraints uh, down there. So we get to know those guys a little bit more. Yep. And that's the benefit of the Senior Bowl in, in uh, setting up the, the interviews down there. Yeah, it's one of those things, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, it's about practice, it's about the game. To me, like you talk about the experience, the, uh, the experience those guys get being in front of these teams and getting a chance to spend time with them. To me, that, that's what makes that pro- part of the process so invaluable. I, it, it cra- it's crazy to me that some guys skip on that part of the process. Right. Uh, that's, that's the thing about it. You come down there, you get a chance, number one, to compete. Yep. You know, see guys go out there, compete against fellow seniors in the country, and then you get a chance to get to know the person. Yep. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge part of the process for sure. And Andy, uh, appreciate the time here on the Journey of the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. We will talk to you soon. Hey, thanks for having me, Fran. Appreciate it. Well, just awesome stuff there from Andy Weidel. You know, really appreciate the time. Obviously, we coming off coming off the bye week. You had the trade deadline the week before. A very, very busy time. We've got the scouting meetings coming up. So really appreciate catching up uh, with Andy Weidel at this busy time of year. All right, before we get to Tony Pauline and Draft Buzz, I want to quickly give a little bit of a tease over to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade. I catch up with Greg Cosell each and every week. And this week, a little bit of a taste that uh, of some of the things that we talk about. We talked a little bit after... After we previewed this coming matchup against New England, I asked Greg, you know, with the great weekend in college football, hey, did you catch any of the action? Here's what he had to say. Big week of uh, college football. Did you take in any uh, college well, games? Well, I watched week? the Alabama uh, LSU game. Hell of a game. It was, it was a fun game to watch. I mean, LSU, I thought, kind of dominated the game. Yeah. They did. You know. I mean, the way that Bama came, came back you know, in the third quarter, that was, that was, that was impressive. Um, a lot of guys on both sides. Oh, my God. There's going to be a lot of pros. Yeah. yeah. I was, and I, I watched uh, 12 o'clock. I watched the Penn State and Minnesota game yeah, as well, which was also game. a great one. Um, I didn't see that one. Yeah, it was a fun game. Was, um, what was on at night? I'm trying to remember what I watched at night. So, you had Oklahoma, Iowa State. Turned out it would be a nice game. Yeah, I watched a little uh, of that. Not too by, much. Pulled one out late. And uh, Clemson, North NC State. Yeah. I started there. Uh, full full uh, disclosure. Fell asleep. It was 28 nothing by the end of well, the first yeah, quarter. Yeah. So, fell asleep during the game. Woke up for a mid, mid to late third quarter for Oklahoma, went over there right. and watched them just did. I got to admit, I've just seen TV, and I don't know if you've taken a peek at them on tape at all, yeah. but I was. it was the first full LSU game I watched. Yeah. I've seen bits and pieces. I was impressed with Joe Burrow. I think Joe Burrow might be real dealish. Yeah, I mean, I think I think he's one of those guys, just again, all this is TV yeah. watching. I think he's a loose, easy thrower. He's not a gun, but he can make the throws. Yep. Um, he's. I think he's one of those guys that's kind of naturally accurate. Mm. Yeah. I think he just... Puts the ball where it needs to be. He he's going to be very interesting because he's not like toolsy. He's not as toolsy as Justin Herbert or no. Jordan Love or even Tua. But I think I did watch Jordan Love. By the way, they played at night. Oh, they played. That's right. He had apparently was. I know statistically it was very. good He game. had a very good game. That's the. I knew there was a game I watched at night yeah. and I couldn't. Re- you know, it was two days ago. I can't remember. Yeah, of course, <laughs> You've watched a lot of football. Since I, know, I know. Um, well, no, it's. I, I. I'm glad that you. Uh, you bought that. It was a. It was a very good game. Really fun game to watch. Yeah. Uh, but Burrow's going to be very interesting just because. Um, you know, he's playing the position very, very well. Correct. How you discern that from who's a better prospect, it's going to be an interesting discussion over the next few months. Without question. And I think he's going to be one of the... I don't want to say he'll be polarizing because I don't... My guess is no one's going to say they they hate him. Right. But now we're talking about is he a top one or two or three pick in a draft? Of course. That's a different question. 
And that's the kind of thing you can get from Greg Cosell and I each week on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade, found wherever you can get podcasts. And appreciate everybody that promotes that podcast on all forms of social media. And really appreciate those of you who go on and rate, review, all and subscribe to all of our podcasts wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, let's get now to Draft Buzz with Tony Pauline. Let's get the word on the street around the country when it comes to next April's draft. Now it's time for Draft Buzz. All right, pleased to welcome back for another segment of Draft Buzz here on the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA, our friend Tony Pauline from the Pro Football Network. Tony, uh, we're talking a lot about Senior Bowl prospects. Obviously, it's that time of year. Uh, last week, the invite, the acceptances, I should say, started rolling in of guys that are planning to attend the event in January. And I want to start it off with a guy that got announced uh, midway through the day on Monday afternoon, and that's Tennessee pass rusher Daryl Taylor. Daryl Taylor, uh, what are people saying about this kid? Uh, you know, obviously, uh, a guy that was seen as a little bit polarizing end of the year. I I was pretty high on him. Not everybody was as high. So excited to hear what your your uh, information has been saying uh, about Daryl Taylor at this point in the process. Well, scouts loved his upside. Mm-hmm. He got a huge grade from scouts coming into the year. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he seems the problem with him was consistency. He was not. He was not. His his production was kind of spotty and all over the place. Now, he's had a very good three game stretch. He passes the eyeball test. He's got the size speed numbers that you want in, in a linebacker. Uh, it's a matter of consistency and the senior bowl will be a good test for him because now he's going to be asked to make plays going in reverse, you know, in in those one-on-ones against the tight ends, against the running backs, we'll be able to see, is he just an up the field sort of, you know, out in the flanks, uh, linebacker, or is he a guy who can play in space? So he looks the part. It's just a matter of him pulling it all together and really playing up to the level of ability that people believe he has. Yeah, that, he was a guy. I remember when we did our SEC preview back in the summer. You know, I had mentioned, look, it, the 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 storyline, the arc is very similar to Josh Allen, not the level of Josh Allen from a prospect standpoint. Who, uh, by the way, Josh Allen has been tearing it up down in Jacksonville. He's been better than I thought he'd be early in his career. Um, he's really put it together for the Jaguars. But I think when you look at Taylor, you know, a former high school receiver, athletic kid, can turn the corner. You know, shows the ability to hold up at the point of attack. You like you said, you just wanted to see that consistency. Him pull it all together. Uh, I'm excited to kind of dive into the film. I know he's been battling through some stuff down there at Tennessee this year. Obviously the record uh, has not been what they had hoped coming into the season, but uh, ultimately a guy I'm very excited about. I'm excited to see him down there in Mobile. I wanted to ask you about a couple other guys uh, in the front seven and a team that obviously got a huge win this week in the Minnesota Gophers over the number four Penn State Nittany Lions. Um, you know, We'll talk about two guys in that front seven that did accept invitations to the senior ball. Linebacker Kamal Martin who has been battling through injuries. He actually didn't play in the win over Penn State. And then Carter Coughlin, uh, a guy who's been a big part of this program over the last few years. Not really, he's listed as a starter, but kind of a rotational sub-package player who's a very impactful player, though, on that front four. They line him up, up and down the line. Yeah, really, a stark contrast to Daryl Taylor, where these guys, Kamal Martin, especially Coughlin, are are far are exceeding scouts expectations they're mm. playing way above their heads which is what happens at minnesota you remember a year ago blake cashman a guy, basically a guy who was great as a street free agent before the season turns out to uh, gets a combine invite turns out to be the fifth round pick of the new york jets is far and away the best uh, rookie on the jets roster this year but but as far as martin is concerned terrific measurables six foot three about 240 pounds plays in the four sevens, can go laterally in pursuit, can make plays up the field, was graded as early as a uh, fourth round pick by some scouts coming into the year. So he is really, I believe, he is exceeding expectations of some scouts and in others, he's playing where he should be. As far as Coughlin's concerned, you know, he's more of a, he's a college defensive end who has an outside linebacker body for the next level. 36 tackles, eight tackles for loss, four and a half sacks, four pass breakups. Mm. So he kind of does everything very well. And again, Coughlin was not even graded by scouts coming into the year. He was off the radar. He has now put himself on the radar, not only with a good senior campaign, but also now being invited to the senior bowl. So we'll be able to see what type of athlete he is against some of the, uh, you know, the, the elite athletes from the senior class that'll be there in mobile. But again, you know, you, you look at Taylor who has not uh, from Tennessee, who has not met expectations and people are waiting for him to pull the pieces together. And then you look at the uh, players that PJ Fleck at Minnesota continues to turn out. These guys beat expectations and, and look prime for the next level. 
Yeah, Coughlin's an interesting guy because, you know, one of the things I like most about him, he's very effective on stunts and twists and blitzes up front. They line him up, like I said, up and down the line. He's a high effort guy. He's not going to wow you with, you know, his power or his athleticism or anything like that. But, you know, just a really good uh, technician at the, in terms of his ability to win uh, in a number of different ways. He kind of reminds me a little bit of Kyler Fackrell. Uh, you remember him a couple years ago coming out of yeah. Utah State. Uh, and he's now turned into a nice role player for the Green Bay Packers. I was just talking about him. Uh, with Ben Fennell, actually. He kind of reminds me very much of Kyler Fackrell when he was coming out of Utah State. All right, uh, Tony, let's get into some other options here. Uh, Give us a player whose stock is on the rise now over the last few weeks. You know, there were so many from this weekend because this past Saturday was one of the best college football Saturdays I can remember in a long time. And it started with that Minnesota-Penn State game, LSU-Alabama. You had Michigan State against the Illinois, Illinois coming back. There was just so many good games. And, and, you know, that Alabama-LSU game, I probably could have picked seven guys just from that game. But I'm going to go with Rashard Lawrence, a guy who didn't have great stats in the game, had four tackles, half a sack, half a tackle for loss, did break up two passes. But when you watched him, you know, the stats didn't tell the story because whenever he was able to get penetration, it basically allowed his teammates to make plays on the ball and LSU w- was disrupting the, the disrupting the play. But when they were able to contain him at the line of scrimmage, Alabama was able to pick up positive yards. So it was the, the little things that didn't show up on the, on the stat sheet. And I know you like Rashard Lawrence, where they moved them up all over the lined them up all over the field, where he was just doing the little things that doesn't show up on the stat sheet, but altered the momentum of plays. And at times, when he was getting penetration, his teammates were able to make game-impacting plays, which stopped Alabama drive. So I, I think, you know, you can't look at the stats. You've got to look at the film because what Richard Lawrence did really, I think, was part and parcel to why Alabama, uh, why LSU not only won the game, but really beat Alabama from the get-go because mm-hmm. Alabama was re- never really in that game until the very end. And it was it was the LSU defense led by Richard Lawrence that I think uh, had the biggest part of it. He was just terrific. Yeah, he's a guy, I, you mentioned, I'm a big fan of him and the way that he plays the game. A uh, high effort guy, uh, a, a two, I like to say a two-gap player that has one gap quickness. So he's strong enough to hold his own at the point of attack. He can anchor down. He can hold on to double teams, keep linebackers free. But he's also got that explosive first step to penetrate and make plays on the other side of the line. When they really cut him loose, you could see that athleticism, that ability to penetrate. He's just not always asked to do it in that scheme. So this is a guy that I think has the ability to be a more productive pro, depending on the scheme that he goes to, than what we've seen in college. I I think he's got a really interesting upside. I would expect we'll see him at the senior ball. Obviously, he has not been announced. I don't think we've seen any LSU players announced so far for the Senior Bowl. I don't think uh, Coach O wanted to get those invites into those guys' hands before that big game against the Crimson Tide. All right, uh, let's get now into your small school standout. Who's a guy outside the Power Five that we need to have our eyes on uh, at this point late in the season? This guy's a long way from outside the Power Five. He's a Division II guy from Tarleton State. Tarleton mm-hmm. State, I believe they're ranked number two or three in Division II. They're going to be going to the playoffs. They're undefeated this year. They're a cornerback, Prince Robinson a name to keep an eye on, a guy, a, a terrific cornerback who also doubles as a game-breaking return specialist. Mm. He's got excellent size, goes about 5'10", 190 pounds, plays in the 4-4s. Four He's got four interceptions this year. He's broken up 12 passes. He's explosive. He plays big football. He's got solid ball skills. As I said, he can double as a punt and kick returner. Robinson's a guy. Would love to see him get an invite to the Shrine game. I think he's definitely worthy of it. He came into the season graded by scouts as a priority free agent. I think he's improved his play. I, I, I think he's a guy that will get consideration in the late rounds of the draft. And I, I think he's definitely worth I mean, we've seen we've seen guys from McNeese State there in the past and, and other small schools from the area. Uh, Tarleton State, Division II school. Robinson is one of the reasons why they're undefeated with his play on defense and special teams. Yeah, certainly, certainly that return ability will help him and his value uh, moving forward. All right, Tony, let's uh, get our eyes and our focus now to this week. What's one individual matchup uh, that you're excited to watch here this coming Saturday? Well, it was disappointing that Wake Forest lost the way they did to Virginia Tech, or I think the yep. Clemson-Wake Forest game really would have taken on big meaning this weekend. 
But I really want to watch the defensive secondary in Clemson. Uh, A.J. Terrell, the cornerback, who I absolutely love. I have a third-round grade on him. There are some scouts that grade him as a second-rounder. And their safety, Kevon Wallace, who we spoke about, he'll be at the Senior Bowl, yep. graded as a late-rounder. Against that air attack uh, of Wake Forest, Jamie Newman, the quarterback that's having a terrific year. Sage Surratt, who we may not play this weekend because he's a little bit banged up. He's playing lights out. Uh, they got two other receivers there in Scotty Washington, the big, the big senior, and another kid, Kendall Hilton who's come out of nowhere, want to see how the Clemson secondary reacts to that air attack of, uh, of Wake Forest that's got three or four, uh, two or three legitimate next-level players, I think except for Scotty Washington and Hinton, who are seniors, both Jamie Newman and Sage Sherratt are going to go back to school. But I think it's going to be a terrific matchup. Yeah, it's going to be one, uh, one that's going to be very fun to watch. Hopefully, Sage Surratt's able to go. Uh, you know, right before we went live, there was news that, uh, you know, like you said, he is a little banged up. So we'll see if he's able to go this week against Clemson. We had Ben on last week talking about that Wake Forest offense and how it's really a group you got to watch, especially moving forward. If, that, if those guys all go back for next year, that's a team that can, you can make some noise there in the ACC with another year of experience. All right, so I'm going to keep my focus in the ACC as well. I want to look at NC State against Louisville. And one of these guys that we haven't yet talked about uh, that's going to the Senior Bowl is NC State defensive tackle Lorel Murchison. I had a chance to study him late last week, Tony, and I don't know uh, what you've heard about this kid, um, but kind of similar to Richard Lawrence from a the fact that he's really good at the point of attack. He's very violent. He's strong. He's stout, but he's also really athletic and can make plays on the other side of the line of scrimmage. This is a former uh, high school running back and defensive end that they you know added some growth or some weight to. They saw the growth potential there and made him a defensive tackle. So now he's He's this quick penetrating three technique that can make plays from sideline to sideline. I was pretty impressed with this kid. I, I think they, they've really got the, the ability. When you look at some of the defensive tackles that are already going to this game, you know, you would talk about the Gallimores and the Kinlaws and, you know, the guys like that, uh, the, the Jason Strobridges of the world. You throw in a guy like Murchison, you assume that Rashard Lawrence is going, you assume a guy like Raquan Davis is going. Derek Brown, potentially from Auburn. There's a lot of good defensive tackles in this senior class. It's, it's going to be an interesting group, but uh, Lorel Murchison this week against Louisville and that upstart offense, I think it'll be an interesting matchup. Scouts love Murchison coming into the year. I think he's played beyond expectations. The question is, how does he fit at the next level? I don't think he's a traditional defensive tackle. I think he's more of a three-technique type of guy. doesn't yep. have the great bulk. Uh, but like you said, you know, he's very athletic, good change of direction, great quick. Every All the elements you want in a three-technique tackle. Um, but he definitely has played much better than I think uh, people expected. He came in with with second second day grades, I should yep. say, second day grades, and, and he's played very well. He's been on a force uh, on that uh, North Carolina State team that I think that's been a little bit uh, disappointing this year, yep. although they've had a lot of injuries. Sure. Um, but again, uh, you know, he he could he could play defensive and in, in a three man front that uses one gap uh, sort of principle yep. where you you put the linebacker up at the line of scrimmage or you put him next to a real big body gap occupier at the next level, I think he'll do a good job. Yeah, he's a guy that really impressed me uh, on film. Excited to see more of Murchison down the road. All right, uh, let's wrap this up with our mock draft roundup. We're going to go uh, to Vinny Iyer from the Sporting News. Has the Eagles selecting 18th overall in his most recent mock draft over at the Sporting News and has them taking LSU corner Christian Fulton. We talked about his teammate earlier in Richard Lawrence. Fulton, another guy we would expect to see him in Mobile at the Senior Bowl. Uh, what are your thoughts on the value there with Christian Fulton? I think a few months ago, everyone was like, oh yeah, the value, that makes a ton of sense. That's great value. I don't know that people, you know, I don't think the shine is kind of worn off Fulton. Not as many people are talking about him, I think, because of Derek Stingley, the true freshman corner uh, there for the Tigers. Yeah, I think it's a combination of a couple of things. I think he's shown a lot of inconsistency on the field this year. He's had his moments, but there are times where he can't make plays uh, with his back to the ball. And then, you know, w whether it's any of the other guys in that LSU secondary that have really stood out, I, I think he kind of has, like you said, taken the shine off of Fulton and maybe pushed him down a little bit. I like him more as a potential late first round pick in those last 10 selections. I think the 18th pick is a little bit too early, but I mean, I'm only talking about seven or eight selections. So, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, quibble if, uh, if that's the direction Howie Roseman goes, goes in because Howie Roseman does a great job at what he does. All right, well, Tony, really appreciate the time here, as always, on Draft Buzz on the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. Uh, we will talk to you next week, man. Enjoy another weekend of college football. Sounds good.
Get a behind-the-scenes look at a life with the Philadelphia Eagles on the Eagles Insider Podcast presented by Lincoln Financial Group. From football to pop culture, no topic is off-limits with the Eagles Insider Dave Spadaro. Subscribe today wherever you listen to podcasts. And I teased it last week. The interview that Dave did with Alec Halaby was a really fun listen. So if you're into analytics and that, that side of the football operation department, well, make sure you go and listen to last week's edition of the Eagles Insider Podcast. All right, uh, let's now get into a play player that I'm really excited about, a guy that I think has a really high ceiling in this upcoming NFL draft, a guy that will be down in Mobile for the Reese's Senior Bowl. That is Florida pass rusher Jonathan Grenard. Dim those lights. We're headed to the film room for the scouting report. All right, so this week on Scouting Report, we're going to go through one of the Senior Bowl acceptances, and we talked about this guy's teammate earlier in their show with Ben, and that's that was Jabari Zaniga. This guy is Jonathan Grenard, the other pass rusher down there for the Gators. I've got my notes right here. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see that I'm holding uh, my notes right here. He was not on the Senior Bowl watch list entering the year. Ben mentioned that earlier. We've had a bunch of guys that have been accepted in this initial round of Senior Bowl announcements that were not on the watch list, so a lot of credit to those guys who just put their head down and went to work. Um, but ends up, you know, this kid... Uh, one-year starter now for the Gators, playing for Todd Grantham. He started his career playing for Todd Grantham up at Louisville. Then when Grantham went to, to Florida with Dan Mullen, this kid was looking to transfer last year from Louisville, ended up playing for the Gators, which is also the team he grew up rooting for uh, down in Florida. Uh, he lines up primarily to the open side, away from the tight end, so they try and keep him clean off the edge. 6'3", 265, long arms, definitely looks the part, even though he's a little bit shorter. Very fluid athlete, explosive out of his stance. He anticipates the snap well. He can threaten the corner. He's got that explosive first step you're looking for. He gains a ton of ground off the ball. Good flex ability turning the corner. He's got the ability to accelerate and close around the hoop in a hurry. As a pass rusher, he wants to win high side. He loves that double hand swipe move. Outside of a, an occasional inside swim, all of his rushes are going outside. And for good, for better or worse, that's kind of how he wants to win is running the hoop. So uh, that's kind of his profile as a pass rusher. He's also got the ability to be very effect, effective on stunts and twists and things like that uh, at the next level. So he wasn't used often in that role so far from what I've seen in Florida, but he definitely, with his movement skills, you get this guy going in on loops, inside Outside, outside, he can be used in a lot of different ways from that standpoint. Even when he didn't get home, he was very active in clogging up passing lanes, getting the ball on the ground from, with pass breakups. Uh, has a good amount, a good feel for that uh, in terms of getting after the quarterback. When he tries to set the edge, he does use his hands pretty well and can hold his ground. He's 265, so you know he's got the ability to play at the point of attack. Uh, from a negative standpoint, I mentioned he, do, he everything wants to be outside with him as a pass rusher. Spends too much time behind the quarterback. He's got to do a better job of keeping the action in front of him. If he feels like he's getting deep, he's got to be able to spin back inside, cross the tackle's face some way. You can be a lot more productive if you're able to do that. You can't sack the quarterback if you're 12 yards into the backfield. So that's one of the concerns. One of those things he can learn and he can develop, get a little bit better in that area. He needs to get a little bit better as well, just using his hands at the top of the rush. Sometimes you know he doesn't use his hands well enough and offensive linemen are able to get into him. You can't just run by people in the NFL. So he's just got some development to do from that standpoint. But, um, you know, this is, again, a kid that uh, has the athletic ability, the explosive first step that you're looking for. Scheme versatile player, high side pass rusher, strong first step, ability to threaten the corner. Um, you know, talent's there to be an impactful pass rusher. The guy that he reminds me of, honestly, is Robert Quinn. I remember Robert Quinn coming out of North Carolina and even watching him this year in Dallas, you know, in the years past with LA and with Miami, uh, this is a guy that can get after the quarterback with speed, with uh, explosiveness, flexibility. Yeah, he might be a little bit of a one trick pony. He only mixes in those low side rushes every once in a while. You'll see him mix in a long arm or a bull rush, but he's just trying to run by you. And that's what this kid can do. I would say, oh, I don't know if he could be a full time player, but at 265, with his ability to hold up against the run, I do think Jonathan Grenard can be a nice defense, a starting defensive end in the the NFL. So certainly a player that can continue to help himself as we get to the senior bowl. All right, let's get now to one. We got a great question here in draft mailbag. Let's wrap up the show. Now it's time to hear from you, the fans in the draft mailbag. 
All right, so as always, rate, review, subscribe. Best way to help us out here on the show. We appreciate everybody that promotes it on social media. But if you go on, wherever you listen, just leave us a comment and leave us a question, and you will get answered here on the show. Uh, Write him, left a five-star review uh, and also left this question. He said, it seems that the Eagles seem to target players that are more closely in an NFL type of system in college. Is it a mandate for most front offices and general managers to look at players that are closest to the scheme that the team runs to get the best look at what the player would look like in their system? Or is that irrelevant because talent translates to the scheme from what they do in college? Very good question. I could provide a very deep answer, but I'll try and hit the, the, uh, the, the important parts here of this, this answer. Number one, you always want your scouts and your coaching staff to be kind of on the same page, right? So uh, if, a, if, you, if you as a scouting staff really like a player and the coaches don't really have a home for them, that doesn't help anybody. You have to have a plan for how you're going to use a player. And so it's really easy if you say, you know what, we're a primarily zone run team you know, offensively in the run game. So uh, you have a running back that is primarily a zone runner in college. That's easy. Apples to apples, you can kind of make that comparison. That doesn't mean that a, a guy who is running primarily gap schemes doesn't fit. You just have to do a little bit more projection. And you could do that, that kind of thing all across the board. I don't know that the uh, that the Eagles have necessarily you know, said, oh, we need, need only pro-style players. I mean, Andre Dillard played in the air raid last year uh, for Mike Leach. That's not an offense that typically uh, you say you get, get top-shelf offensive linemen from. But he was a special prospect and a guy uh, certainly that has shown you know, during his time at the Senior Bowl and last year as a senior that he could be an NFL prospect. And we've seen that uh, here in his rookie season. He's really looked the part uh, in his first few starts. So uh, I think when you look, you do always want your, co- your coaches to be on the same page as your scouts. And they'll often, a lot of teams, you'll hear you know, in the summer, They'll get together with their scouts and just kind of go through, just kind of rehash everything that they look for position by position. This is what we need in a middle linebacker. This is what we need in a corner. This is what we need in an X receiver or on a running back. This is what we're looking for across the board. So now when the scouts go out on the road, if they see somebody that just doesn't fit, they're still going to write the guy up and do all the legwork on him, but you'll kind of know he, this guy, you know, he does X, Y, Z, but at the end of the day, he's not quite a fit for us, and so he may not make it to your final draft board when it gets to late April, but uh, certainly uh, that's part of the process that is very, very important. Uh, the best teams are always on the same page in terms of their scouts and their coaches, and that's something uh, that the Eagles certainly do, try, do strive to do, and they've done a good job of that uh, over the course of the last few years. All right. Loaded, loaded show. I'm my voice is going. We talked with uh, so many different guests. So much thanks to Andy Weidel and obviously Ben Fennel and Tony Pauline for all their time here this week on the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. Enjoy another great weekend of college football. We will talk to you next week.